Welcome to the vlog. A person who thinks all the time has nothing to think about except thoughts. So, he loses touch with reality and lives in a world of illusions. By thoughts I mean specifically chatter in the skull, perpetual and compulsive repetition of words, of reckoning and calculating. I'm not saying that thinking is bad, like everything else is useful in moderation. A good servant, but a bad master. And all so-called civilized peoples have increasingly become crazy and self-destructive because through excessive thinking they have lost touch with reality. That's to say, we confuse science with the real world. Most of us would have rather money than tangible wealth, and a great occasion is somehow spoiled for us unless photographed. And to read about it the next day in the newspaper is oddly more fun for us than the original event. This is a disaster, for as a result of confusing the real world of nature with mere signs, we are destroying nature. We are so tied up in our minds that we've lost our senses. Time to wake up. What is reality? Obviously, no one can say, because it isn't words. It isn't material, that's just an idea. Reality is... How's everybody doing? Good. What you watched was our uh, CIY highlight video. And that means Christ in Youth. And that is where our teens went for the summer. And um, I have to tell you, it looked like they had a great time, right? Like they did. But, but when they come back, I don't know if you've heard some of the baptism videos recently, but their lives have been changed. <laughs> they have met Jesus. And, um, and it, is, it is incredible. And so the reason we showed that is because you can register now. Um, online on our app, Crosspoint Now, you can register for CIY. Um, and there's something new and exciting that's happening this year as well, is that they have extended CIY to not just, we usually take a middle school group, which is going into sixth grade through eighth grade, and we take a high school group, which is going into ninth grade through twelfth grade. But this year, they have now started that fourth and fifth grade. You know those awkward years? Yeah, they have started one for that age group. And Katie Jugenheimer, our, our children's pastor, yeah, has agreed. She said, this would be great. She's really excited. So if you have a, a, a child, kid, 
almost teen, whatever, they call, get called nowadays, I can't keep up. Um, if they're getting ready to go into fourth or fifth grade, you can register for them for CIY as well. And I love um, our philosophy in our student program and in our, in our student XP and in our kid XP. The philosophy is not only to instruct them in the ways of Christ, but to put positive adult leaders in their life that they can learn to depend on as well as their parents. Because we have, we have discovered that this makes a huge, huge difference on them making better decisions, having somebody to talk to, and somebody that invests in them as well as their parents. And so that, that is what we do every Wednesday night, every Sunday morning, and um, it's also a, a big part of, of CIY. So I highly recommend that you guys sign up for that if you guys have teens or if you're an adult leader and uh, you want to go because we need some of those too. So anyway, um, welcome. I'm so glad that you guys are here today. My name's Tammy. And i um, glad you're in the room. Sometimes it's easier to make that decision to not come, and I'm glad you guys made that today. Um, if you're joining us online, we are really glad that you're with us as well. Give us a shout out. Um, tell us, hey, um, we have moderators that would love to talk with you, answer any questions, pray with you, whatever you might need. So um, hopefully you reach out to us there as well. If this is your first time here, um, especially glad that you made that choice to walk through those doors, because sometimes that can be a little hard to do. Um, but we also want to get a chance to just say hi and say, hey, is there any questions that we can answer for you about who we are or what we do and why we do what we do, those kind of things. Um, you can go to the welcome table and just say, hey, it's my first time. And we will donate $5 in your name to one of the organizations that we partner with here in town, the Backpack Program and the Women's Crisis Center. So we used to give away like a gift and then we thought, hey, you know what? Who we are is that we are here not to benefit ourselves, but to benefit those around us. So we switched that, and instead of the $5 for the gift, we now give the $5 to the community. So if you ever wondered why we started doing that, now you know the story. Um, so anyway, uh, there's a couple of things that are happening that are coming up that I need to tell you about. The first one is next week, next Sunday, October 27th at 7 o'clock at night. And I'll repeat that just because now you're like, I don't know if I want to come. I don't even know what it is, right? Okay, so I'll tell you what it is. We are having a partner's D&D, &D, which is dessert and discussion. I know, the dessert, I had you there, right? Right? Okay, so you're having that. And um, what's going on is this Out of the Boat series not only affected us individually, but it affected us as a church as well. Because God has, has shown us some ways that we as a church need to step out of the boat. And one of those ways we discussed last week when we talked about going to the East End. And so if you have any questions on that, about anything that we're doing at Crosspoint right now or decisions that have been made or whatever, um, this is the time to ask those and try to get some answers on what's going on and uh, hopefully we uh, eliminate some disconnect, okay? So that is happening next Sunday night. Again, I told you I'd repeat it, October 27th at 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock and there is dessert involved, all right? So that's the other th one thing. Now, we called it a partner's D&D &D because our partners are the ones that have decided to partner with us in ministry, with us as a church in ministry. And so we are having offering a partnership opportunity November 3rd. So that is the following week. So on November 3rd, after the 1130 service, we will be providing dinner. There will be child care. And we will sit down and talk, tell you why we started a church, what we believe in. Um, what, why we structure things the way we do, why sometimes we do the things we do. And just kind of give you an idea um, how, what it looks like to get more connected. How do I get more involved? Um, those kind of things. And so that is called, and then you can decide, hey, I think I do. I want to partner with Crosspoint in the ministry that we're trying to do um, within the community and within our world. Okay, so that is happening November 3rd, but we kind of need to know if you're coming to that because there's food and there's child care. So we need to know, you know, if, if we have, you know, two people back there and 25 kids, we need more people back there, right? So, or, you know, 12 people, um, Chad's pretty amazing, but he's not going to feed us all with five loaves and two fishes, okay? So we need to know how much food to have too. So just let us know, and uh, you can do that at the welcome table. And it's, been, it's just great having you guys here today. Um, so as we get started, Chad is going to be bringing our message today. We are finishing our series out of the boat. I have to tell you, I have loved hearing the discussion on this. This series has affected us, and I love it. People have come up to me and said, hey, this is what I'm doing to get out of the boat. I'm still praying about what that looks like for me, and I, I think that's great. And I hope that that continues to, to live in us. But today is the last, um, the last 
session of Out of the Boat, and Chad is going to start with telling us um, his message, and then we're going to worship afterwards, and it's going to be a great time. So as we get started, let's stand up, say hi to a few people around you, make them feel extremely welcome today, and we'll get started. hear me now. There we go. All right. Sorry about that. I'm sure it was my fault. Um, That's why usually they don't give me one of these things because he's like, he can't hit the button right. So I want to thank you all for being here, but I also want to thank you that last week when we announced about um, partnering with River Outreach and being a part of East End and kind of doing a new type of campus, um, not only did you all show your support through applause, but you also Many of you have already stepped forward, and we have already, in just a week's time, 13 people who have said, we want to be a part of that in some way, and also um, mentioned that it's going to be about $10,000 to be able to provide the breakfast and invest into the ministry they do, the homeless there, and um, already in one week's time, $2,040 has already come in for that, and we really didn't even ask, so you guys are amazing and awesome for that. And today I'm really excited because this is the youngest person I have ever had the opportunity to interview. She's so young that we actually had to have her mom help her come up here. So would you welcome Allie and Amelia Pittacus? Welcome them. Come on up. So Allie, I'm going to have you start by just um, reminding everybody of how old she is and um, some of the new things she's doing and trying to do in this stage of development. She's nine months, um, and she's been walking around the coffee table, um, crawling everywhere. Um, she even growls at a lot of people. Yes. <laughs> that could come in handy, growling, yeah. And so do you, do, you um, do the little thing? We used to hold our kids. They would hold their little hand and put them on the floor, and they would try to take steps and stuff. You think she is in the mood to... Try that for us. You want to try it? Yeah? You going to do it? There you go. Walk those feet. Nope, nope, we're done. Good. Awesome. Good job. Yeah, you did great. And so when, at this stage of development, when you and her dad, Kyle, um, and grandparents and family, and they see her try, but she fails, kind of what is, what is your response to that? We just try to let her know that, you know, she'll get it next time, applaud her, and um, kind of encourage her that, you know, she'll get it. Okay. You want to? What are you going to say? Yeah, you're going to growl? I would love to hear you growl. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah. So you guys don't ridicule her. You don't put her down. Kyle doesn't make her do baby push-ups in the other room, you know, don't withhold food or something. No, when, when, when there's this stage, every failed attempt, right, is getting them a little closer to success. Awesome. Well, you guys are an awesome family, and I'm very thankful that you are in our church family. Do you encourage them and thank them? So see ya. It's almost like she knew that she was going to say that. She's like, you took the mic away. Get it back. The reason I share that today is because um, at that stage of life, everybody assumes that when you fail, 
it's not a bad thing. When you fail, it's actually something to be applauded. Like Ali said, it's something to be encouraged. It's something to be celebrated because you know at that stage of life, it's those failed attempts, right, that get us to success. And without the failures, without the falling down and getting back up, they're never going to be able to get to the independence and the, and the development that we hope for them. And so parents, as parents and grandparents and family, when the little ones are trying, we celebrate not only their successes, but we celebrate their failures. I remember when our kids, when we were potter training our kids, and, and, and honestly, it was Kimberly who was potty training our kids because I had no patience for that. If it was left up to me, our kids would probably still be in diapers because... I just did it. The investment of time that that takes, if you've ever tried to help a child take those steps, that is, it can be exhausting. It can be tiring. And Kimberly was committed. She felt like that was an important thing for them to learn for their adulthood. And so she stuck with it, thank God. And when they were being potty trained, I remember that even if they would mess up and they would tell us too late that they had to go to the restroom, we still celebrated with them because we knew that they were getting it. They were starting to figure it out, and it's okay. Those failures are going to lead you someplace good as long as we keep on trying and we keep on celebrating we keep on progressing. And, when the, and if you had told me pre-kid that one day I would, I would like clap my hands and I would cheer and I would celebrate and I would experience some sort of emotional elated state over another little human being using the restroom, I would have said, you're crazy. But when you see your child for the first time, they do it. You like celebrate when they walk for their first time. Oh my goodness, get the camera. It's amazing. We celebrate these things because we know it took a whole bunch of failed attempts to get us to this success. And we understand with our children at that age, if we don't encourage the failures, they're never going to get to the success. And you all got that message. I I know you got that message growing up at at least the earliest part of your lives because had you not, you probably would have crawled in here. But I watched. No one crawled in here on their hands and knees because you got the message when you were little. It's okay that you fell down when you tried to walk for the first time. You didn't say to yourself, well, I'm a failure. Yep. I'm not going to do this again. No, that kind of hurt when I fell down. I will crawl for the rest of my life. No, you got the message from somebody. It's okay. Get back up. Try again. Even when you fail, it's okay because those failures are not a roadblock to success. They're a pathway to success. And we understand that at that stage of life. But then we get a little bit older, and I believe we start to get a different message. We get a little bit older And we start to get a message that failure isn't something to celebrate. And in one degree, I mean, it's natural. It's a part of life. We are supposed to grow up. We're supposed to take responsibility for our choices and our actions. And that's a healthy thing. And, 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 and we don't want to act like certain bad choices and failures are just okay and that we should just act like they're no big deal and we should, everybody should clap their hands. But there's this other side where it's like we almost go too far in our society and we become so performance-based that everyone, including ourselves, begins to judge ourselves whether we should be rewarded or in some way kind of demeaned and punished based upon how well we do or don't do on any given day, at any given task, at any given moment. And not just what we do, but who we are even begins to be identified based upon kind of that performance mentality. And we lose sight of the fact that failure once was not a roadblock, but a pathway to success. And all of a sudden, somewhere along the way, we get a different message and we begin to actually fear failure. And I think it's why 11 out of 12 people, 11 out of 12 churches, decide to just stay in the boat where they're comfortable. Because we get focused on the part of the story of Peter sinking. Let's just remind ourselves of of that. Uh, Matthew chapter 14, beginning at verse 29. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And you can almost hear the other 11 in the boat saying, see, that's why we didn't do this. See, I I mean, we were about to, had he just walked on water, I was about ready to step out myself. I was about ready to go join them, but then I saw him sink, and I'm like, see, that's why. I knew Peter shouldn't have done that. That's why I don't do this, because I've seen other people try to do this and fail. I've tried myself, and I failed, and I've told myself, I've vowed to myself, I promised myself I would never take that risk again. Why? Because we've gotten the, the message that failure is something to be feared as a roadblock to success rather than something that possibly could become a pathway 
to success. And I think we, we learn to deal with our failures, a fear of failure in all different ways. Some of us learn to deal with fear of failure and we stay in our boat by overcompensating in some area of our lives where we're really good. And we're like, you know what, I can't do this, this, and this. I'm a failure at those things, but I will be the best at this. And so we like not only succeed, but we over succeed in an area of our lives. And we put everything we have into proving to ourselves and to everyone else that we're not a failure because we can do this really, really well. The problem is that we can't even enjoy our success. We can't even have gratitude toward God's and and use it as a generous gift to others because all we can see is really not what we've gained, but what we're afraid we'll lose. And so overachieving sometimes is just a, a, a different way of running from our fear of failure. And then others of us, we just try to cover it up. I remember when Seth was little, I had told him before dinner, he had asked for a cookie. And I said, Seth, you can't have a cookie yet. We're going to have dinner soon. And I came, I went up to the upstairs, changed clothes from uh, work, and was going to go out in the yard and work, change clothes, come down. And Seth, I look at him, and he has chocolate cookie all around his face. And so I asked him the obvious question. Seth, did you just eat a cookie when I told you not to? And you know what Seth said? No. He lied, the little liar. I mean, he looked me in the eye with a cookie on his face and lied to me. And, and he's not the only one who does it. I do it too. I do it too because I don't want to admit. I hate to admit when I'm wrong. I don't want to believe I'm wrong. I don't want you to know that I'm wrong. Don't we do that? We will do just about any of things, some of us, to cover up our failure because we got the message a long time ago. Failure is something you should fear. Failure is a roadblock to success. Failure isn't going to help you get anyway. And so even if we admit it, we will blame everybody and everything else for our failure rather than accept it and own it ourselves just out of fear of failure. And others of us, <laughs> we don't cover it up. We don't overachieve. We just lay down and wallow in it like a pig in the mud. We just lay down and we're like, you know what? This isn't just something I've done. This isn't just a mistake I've made. This isn't just something I'm not good at. I just own it so much so that it's almost, well, it is unhealthy. I wallow in it to the point that my failure is now allowed to become part of my identity. And it becomes my excuse not to move forward. It becomes my rationalization and my justification to just stay stuck in what I've always been in. My habits, my hurts and hang-ups, yep, that's not just what I've, that's who I am. And as long as I own it and wallow in it, then the whole world can just better accept it. Because I don't care who I hurt, if I hurt myself or God or someone else, it doesn't matter because this is who I am. We wallow in it. It's just another way of response of our fear into fear of failure. And 11 out of 12 people will stay in the boat and miss out on the possibilities that God has for us for our fear that we might be the one who steps out and it all goes wrong. We step out and it sink. But what if, think about this, what if the point of the story that we've been looking at for the last several weeks isn't just that God wants you to experience a miracle and walk on water? Maybe the reason they left this in, because they didn't have to leave this part in about Peter sinking. Maybe the reason they left it in is because Jesus didn't just want us to know that in the storm we can walk on water. He also wanted us to know what he does when we're in the storm and we lose sight of what's important and we begin to sink. And maybe, maybe more than anything else in this series, maybe somebody needs to hear today what God's response to your failure and my failure is. And it might surprise us. And so in Matthew 14, here's Jesus's response, beginning at verse 31. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? Immediately, Jesus caught him. As soon as Peter began to sink, as soon as Peter began to go underwater, he cried out, Lord, save me. And what did Jesus do? Did he wait until Peter had sunk a little bit, had, was gasping for air, and said, okay, now you're learning the lesson here. Now I'll help you. No. Did, Peter, did Jesus give him a little lecture first and say, hey, there's something you need to hear from me before I'm going to reach out my hand and pull you up out of this. You've got to hear this. No. The first thing that Jesus did immediately, Matthew says, Jesus reached out his hand and pulled us up. And I think for some of us, it is really easy to understand and believe in a God who loves us and shows us favor and accepts us when we're doing everything right. 
When we're walking on water and we have the faith to walk on water, we can very easily, many of us, receive God's favor in our lives and say, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, God, I'm, that's right, you and me, we're doing well right now. Look at me, I'm walking on water, God, isn't this awesome? And we almost think that somehow we have earned God's love and favor. We almost think we've deserved God's love and favor. But the truth of the matter is, grace, in its definition, is unmerited favor, undeserved favor. And the truth is, God loves us and accepts us and shows us favor just as much when we are walking on water than when we step out and we end up sinking. And if we can begin to get this image of God in our heads, then it will change the way we view our failure. Because the truth is, if you want to walk on water, then Jesus shows us, let me show you how to make failure a pathway to success. Let me change the way you see failure. And part of the way we change the way we see failure is we start changing the way we see God. He is the God who as soon as we sink and we cry out to him, he pulls us up. He is just as much there for us in our failures as he is in our successes. And if we will begin to believe that, if we'll begin to live in that truth of his love for us, then all of a sudden failure won't be a roadblock to success. We will begin to see it as a pathway to success. But then Jesus' words to them are, you have little faith, why did you doubt? In other words, he's not saying, hey, you sank and it's okay, let's not talk about it, let's just act like it didn't happen, you're forgiven, Uh, let's just not bring this up anymore. No, he says, Peter, now I've got you. You know I love you. You know I'm not giving up on you. You know I still accept you. You don't have to beat yourself up. Let me pull you up. But while I'm doing that, let me ask you a really hard but good question. You had little faith right then. So let's talk about it. Why did you doubt? You see, I see, I hear those words, and I have this way of hearing God as pointing his finger and saying, you a little faith, you little, why'd you doubt? But that's not what he's saying. He wasn't pointing his finger because he had his hand. And as he pulled him up, he's really asking an honest question. Peter, are you willing to learn from your failure? Are you willing to learn from your mistake? Because people who are willing to learn from their failure, people who are willing to grow through their mistake, let me tell you, they will be much more successful than folks who have never failed. Because there is something that you can learn in failure. I can tell you from personal experience that you'll never learn in the successes of life. But we've got to stop being afraid of it. And start embracing it, not so that we have permission just to do whatever we want and, and make whatever choice and say, well, that's, God loves me anyhow. No, but so that we can grow through it and it actually becomes a foundation upon which God begins to build something really good out of something that shouldn't have been good. If you want to walk on water, then don't be afraid to let Jesus show you how failure can be a pathway to success. There's another time that Jesus and Peter we were at a boat scene. And there was another time where Peter jumped out of the boat. He stepped out of the boat, and he didn't walk on water this time, and he didn't sink this time. He swam. It was after, it was after his greatest regret. I want to ask you today, if we went around the room, and I handed you a mic, and we, we sat here for however long it took and listened to each person share, what would you say is your greatest regret at this point in your life? I'll be honest, and I could tell you I could share a few. What's your greatest regret? And maybe for others, we'd ask a different question. What failure, potential failure, failure do you fear the most? What are you afraid that you're going to lose? What are you afraid you're going to mess up? What are you gonna, afraid is going to happen in the future? What's your fear of failure? Peter's happened the night when Jesus was arrested. At the Last Supper... Jesus and Peter had this conversation where Peter said, Lord, even if everybody else fails you, even if everybody else denies you, even if everybody else doesn't stand with you, you can count on me. I will be by your side and I will die for you if I have to. Jesus said, Peter, tonight before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. No, no, that's not going to happen. They go to the garden. They pray. Judas betrays Jesus. And, what is, and the guards take hold of him. And what do all the disciples do, including Peter? They all run. In fact, the Bible says in Mark that one disciple... 
they grabbed, the guards grabbed his clothes, and Peter was the one who did. He wiggled himself out and ran away naked. That's how much of a coward Peter became in that moment. And he runs, and he gets him close. And he goes to the courtyard where Jesus is facing this mock trial. And he's listening as false witnesses are brought before the court. He listens as people lie about this man who has changed his life. And he warms himself over a little fire. And in the glow of that fire, people start to recognize Peter. Somebody says, aren't you the one who was with Jesus? And he says, no, I, I, I don't know the man. Another one, aren't you the one? I know you're the one. Your accent sounds just like are, you were with Jesus. No, I, I, don't, I don't know the man. And then another one comes along and says, no, I know you. Yes, I see it in your face now. You, I've seen you with Jesus. No, I tell you, I don't know who he is. And before he can get that last word out of denial, the rooster crows. And all of a sudden it hits him. What Jesus said would be true has come true. He is exactly who Jesus said he was. He didn't want to admit it himself. He didn't want to see it himself. He wanted to think he was greater than that, but it was true. And his eyes meet with Jesus's, and all of a sudden, he, the scripture says he ran away and wept bitterly. And now Jesus has been crucified, and now Jesus has been put a tomb, and now Jesus is even resurrected from the dead, and Peter has seen him. But there's still something between he and Jesus. There's this unspoken something. And so, what does Peter do? Peter runs fishing. I think we all have those places we run to or the things we run to when life's not going as we expected, where we fail, when we mess up. We all have these places that we run to, and Peter ran to fishing because fishing was something he was good at. It can be negative. It can be positive. He ran to fishing because that was something he was good at. He's like, you know what? I have really messed up. Let me go do something. It makes me feel a little bit better about myself. I can at least fish. I, before I knew Jesus, before he called me Peter, I was Simon the fisherman, and everyone knew I knew how to fish. So I'm going to go fish tonight. The problem was that night he didn't catch nothing. Have you ever had those times when it feels like no matter what you do, you can't do anything right? You ever had those times when it feels like even the things that you know you can do, that everybody looks at you and says, hey, they, they got that together. Even in those areas of your life, you feel like I don't even have that together right now. That's how Peter felt. Fished all night, caught nothing. Somebody from the shore calls out to him at dawn and says, have you caught anything? Peter says, no, we haven't caught anything. And the voice from the shore says, cast your net on the other side of the boat. And Peter's like, okay, what do I got to lose? He casts the net on the other side of the boat. They haul in 153 fish, the scripture in John chapter 21 records. 153 fish. And that's when John, the other disciples who's with Peter, says, oh my goodness, how do we miss this? This is the Lord. Peter, we've been here and done this before. Remember, cast your nets on the other side. We caught a whole boatload of fish. We didn't catch that. This is the Lord. That's Jesus. How do we not see this? And Peter, what does Peter do? He doesn't just step out of the boat. He jumps out of the boat. He swims on shore. It's almost like Peter's like, you know, it, the scripture says the boat was right behind him. Peter didn't get to shore any faster by swimming than he would have been if he had a boat. But I think sometimes when we do something wrong, when we fail, we have this negative image and this fear of failure that tells us, man, if you can just swim far enough, if you can just swim long enough, if you can just pay enough penance, if you can just do the enough right things to un outweigh the bad things you've done, then somehow you'll earn God's favor again. But friends, you can never swim far enough to receive a grace that God has already given because the Bible says in Romans, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He doesn't see failure like we see failure. We see it as a roadblock to success. He sees it a pathway to success. And if you want to walk on water, we have to begin to See failure in a different way. And so Peter gets out of the water, walks up to Jesus, and Jesus has a fire made. Probably everybody else, when they saw that fire, the other disciples didn't think a thing about it. But what do you think Peter thought of when he saw that fire? Isn't it interesting how certain sights and sounds and smells and places can trigger something inside of us? That everybody else sees the same thing, and it doesn't mean anything to them. But it's something inside of us triggers something from our past, some regret, some failure, someone else's failure that affected us, and it stings. And all of a sudden, without saying a word, Peter's reminded of his denial at the fire not too long ago. And he knows that without saying a word, 
Jesus and him are going to talk about this. Why? Because Jesus wants to condemn him? Because Jesus wants to beat him up? Because Jesus wants to make him feel worse than he already does? No, because Jesus doesn't want his failure to be a roadblock. He wants Peter to trust him enough with his failure to let it be a pathway to success. And so Jesus and Peter have this conversation. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, Lord, you know I do. Second time, Peter, do you love me? Lord, I I don't know how to say it. Yeah, I, I do. I love you. Then Jesus says, feed my sheep. A third time, Peter, do you love me? Lord, I, I don't even know what to, you, you know, it's almost like Peter wanted to say, you know, I want to. <laughs> and Jesus says, feed my sheep. And one time, two times, three times, he asked this question for the three times that Peter denied him as though he's pulling him up. Come on, Peter, let me pull you up out of this. Come on, Peter, don't stay down in that. Come on, Peter, enough with being down in this. Peter, I'm going to ask you a question because really you thought it was about you being a coward. You thought it was about all these other things. You've had a hundred what-if questions and if-only thoughts. No, Peter, be done with all that. Let's ask the main question. Do you love me? This comes down to not your behavior, but your heart, Peter. Where's your heart stand? Do you really love me? Do you want me to let do you want to let me love you? Do you trust me not only in your successes, but do you trust me in your failure? Like that night when you cried out to me, do you still love me, Peter? And Peter, guess what? I'm going to use you past this failure because I'm telling you, go feed my sheep. You see what Jesus did? He took the very thing, the fire that represented his guilt and shame and his failure. And now fire represents his restoration. It represents a new beginning. It represents God taking the thing that should have defined him from that day forward negatively. And he says, now go use that failure and bring good news to others. Feed them this kind of love you've received from me. Because there's lots of other people out there who walk around every day where we work and where we go to school and where we shop that they have these masks on that act like either things, everything's okay or they act like they're mad at the world or, they, or they, they've dived into something that's consuming them and we think we know their story when in reality in some way or another, a lot of times it just has to do with the fact that they feel like they're a failure. <laughs> and Jesus says, if you want to walk on water, then come on. Let me show you how failure can be a pathway to success. You say, well, how in the world do we do that? Well, Peter had time to think about it, and he wrote about it in 1 Peter chapter, uh, one, chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. I love this. Because what Peter does is he throws us right in, back into the tension that this whole series has been talking about from Matthew 14. The tension of whether we're going to stay in the boat or step out of the boat is all about, on the one hand, we want to believe that if we follow God and we trust him and he's calling us and we step out of the boat, then, it's, then what harm can come to us, right? I mean, what harm can come when we do good, right? And so let's step out. Let's believe that. See, yeah, what harm can come to me? I'm going to step out. But then Peter says, but we also know that we live in a broken, sinful, fallen world where everything doesn't go as planned. We're not in heaven yet. And so he says, let's be honest about it. You may step out, and because you do good, what harm can come to you? Or you may step out, and you may suffer in some way. You may sink for a while. You may lose sight. The wind and the waves may become strong. And we're like, well, that's not what I want to hear. Right. I mean, I, I want a guarantee if I'm going to step out of the boat, I want some sort of guarantee that it's only going to be good. I don't want to hear. Yeah, it could be good or you could suffer. Who wants to hear that? No, I'll stay in my boat. Thank you. No, but Jesus is saying, trust me on this. As long as you need a guarantee to step out of the boat, then you are living in bondage. Because hell wants you bound in trusting success or failure rather than trusting him, regardless of you succeeding or failing. And when we step out of the boat and we say, Lord, I trust you, whether I succeed or whether I fail, guess what? Then you have freedom. Then you've stepped into a power and a joy and a love and a blessing, as Peter says, and a courage that Peter's talking about here that no one else knows anything about. It's powerful. I mean, I know what it's like. I struggle with my own fear of failure. There's a lot of things that I haven't done in life that I, that I wish I would have because 
I just was so afraid of what happens if I sink. I still struggle with it today as a church family. I, I, th- I have this in the back of my head where I was like, oh, no, well, what if, when, what if the bottom falls out? You know, what if this doesn't work out? What if I have to move the kids and the family again? I have these fears in my head. And you know one of the best ways to fail is to become consumed by fear of failure and to make it about success or failure rather than step out and make it about him. You say, how do we do that? Revere Christ as Lord in your hearts. 11 out of 12 people, 11 out of 12 churches, I think you could say, are willing to know Jesus as the forgiver of their sins and as their Savior. But 11 out of 12 people, even in the church, are afraid to trust Jesus as their Lord. What's it mean to trust Jesus as Lord? as one who is their master, their boss, the one who's in charge, who truly is in control, even though I say I know I'm not in control, but I truly give that over to him and truly trust him as the one who can be in control of my life. That is a huge step to make. It kind of looks like this. In old maritime history, old boats, you know, those big ships that you see in the movies that have the huge masts and all the sails, and you have to go to a historical place to see a replica now because nobody really sails those ships anymore. Back in those times when a captain would be heading, headed to face an enemy, he had one of two choices, really. Some captains would raise the colors, their flag, as a way of saying, hey, this is who we are, and we're coming. And, and you know, if you want to fight, then we're going to fight. But know who you're fighting. It was kind of a way of saying who you were and who they were coming up against. And some of those captains would just send the flag up, the colors up, and then also tell someone on the crew, get the surrender flag ready. And so they would go down below, and they would tie the surrender flag on the rope below so that if they needed to, they could send the surrender flag up, and they could send their colors down, and basically is saying, this will, this, if it gets too rough, if it gets too dangerous, if too many lives get lost, if we think we're going to lose the ship, okay, you wait for my command, you send up the surrender flag, and then we'll all hopefully be okay. But there were other captains that took their jobs a little more seriously. And there were other captains, when they would go to face an enemy, They knew that the reason they sailed, they knew that their cause, they believed in their country so much that they would say, I don't want you to send our colors up. I want you to take them up. And they would have someone climb up that mast with a hammer and nails. And the captain would say, nail our colors to the mast. As As a way to say to the crew and to the enemy and to himself as the captain, It doesn't matter what the enemy does to us. We don't have a choice of surrender. The reason we fight is too important. The people we fight for, the ones we love, are too important. We're either going to win today or we're going to lose trying, but we're not going to surrender. We're not going to base it on if it's going well, then we'll be faithful. If it's not going well, then we won't go faithful. No, we're going to be faithful to the cause regardless of what happens in the battle. Nail the colors to the mast. And that's what it means to revere Christ as Lord. And that's why I believe he's calling us to step out of the boat at the end of the day. It's not so much about whether we're going to walk on water or we're going to sink. It's about who's in control of your life. Who's going to be in charge of your life. And when you come to the place where you begin to revere Christ, not only as the forgiver of your sins, but as the leader of your life, then guess what? It's no longer, life is no longer hinging on your success or failure. You no longer are successful or a failure. You are someone different. You are a child of God. And no matter what happens outside that boat, he has got your back. But we can't ever receive that until we nail our colors to the mast and say, Lord, no more playing around. No more making it about fair weather Christianity. No more about whether I succeed or fail, then I'll be faithful. Lord, I'm going to be faithful to you. No matter what comes my way, come hell or high water, I've got my colors nailed to the mast. Are you with me? And if you want to walk on water, yeah. If you want to walk on water, then that's what it takes to begin to see failure as a pathway to success. Because now there is nothing that hell can use to try to hold you back. And so in a moment, I'm going to invite you to come up and do something with me. Um, I'm going to invite you to come and nail your colors to the mast. We have a, ma- a replica of a mast over here and over here at the front, and we have these little 
um, colors or flags. And you say, oh, why do we have to do this? I'll tell you why. One thing is that you can't do a series on step out of the boat and everybody just seat, sit comfortably in their rows. That just doesn't make sense, you know? I mean, it's kind of hypocritical to say, yeah, we're going to step out of our boat, but don't ask me to leave my seat. I mean, if we're not willing to leave our seat in this room, how are we ever going to step out of the boat someday out there? And the other thing is, the reason we do this is because it's a reminder to each other that we're not in this alone. And there is something powerful that when I hear somebody else singing on a Sunday morning, when I don't feel like singing, it reminds me that my storm it's going to pass, and I'm going to be able to sing again when I hear you singing. And when I see other people go up to pray with our prayer team at the end, I'm reminded, oh, yeah, we're not in this alone. And so maybe today when you go and if you choose to do this with us and nail your colors to the mast, it's not just about you. You might be encouraging someone else, and together we're reminded that what could happen if a whole church family in Augusta and Maysville and online and eventually in East End would be a people who say, God, whether we succeed or fail, this we know, we're yours. And we trust you have our back no matter what. And maybe this is your first time to start to take seriously this idea of Jesus not just being Savior but Lord. Or maybe you've made that commitment a long time ago. And if you're like me, that's a commitment that regularly needs renewal. Because every time we start to grow and we think, hey, I'm there, there's something else that comes along that says, okay, I need more, <laughs> right? And so this is your opportunity. This is a time of prayer. This is a praying out loud together. And then we'll worship together. But let me pray for you as you decide if you want to participate. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much for this church family. I thank you for their openness to you during this series and how many people have made decisions, some for the first time, to even receive you into their life. We celebrate that and thank you for it. That's a huge boat to step out of. For others taking steps in ministry, others taking steps to help us start something new. And we don't even know what that's fully going to look like yet in the East End, but they're taking these steps with us. Others taking steps in their relationships that they've been praying for. And Lord, I just pray that as we move through this time of worship, that this time of nailing mass, nailing colors to a mass, would be more than just a symbolic act. But as we put that flag on that mast, you would do something in our hearts and our minds that we can't do for ourselves. That you would take us another step away from being defined and defining ourselves and others based upon success or failure. And you would make us a people that so revere you as Lord that whether we succeed or fail, we totally and completely Trust you to bring good through it all. No more of seeing a failure as a roadblock. Let us people be a people who see it as a success. And so, we give up our right to lower our flag. The cause you've called us to is too great. It's eternal. And we won't be a people, by your grace, who give up. In the good and forget you, or in the negative and thank you're not there. We revere you as Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and worship with us? And if you want to participate, meet me down here at one of these stations.
something that you need prayer for. Um, we have prayer people on each side and they, they'd be happy to discuss or pray with you over anything. Um, next week, come back. We've still got more to learn. We've still got more to do. We thank you for being here and for participating. And I hope that Out of the Boat continues to recycle in your heart and in your mind as God continues to lead you and move you in the direction he wants you to go. Have a great week.